um, with AFib, um, I guess that's, when I talk to people, they, they talk about AFib as kind of the one that's, that's the most difficult to live with, it's yeah. the most difficult maybe to be treated. Right. But there are new medications that are out there, are there now. There are medications, we have new blood thinners. So the big risk of atrial fibrillation, and the one we're trying to prevent, is it causes stroke, and it's the one cause of stroke that's preventable if you treat the patient with blood thinners. Right. So it's a big part of what we're trying to do. We're trying to find those patients and at least get rid of that risk. Right. In addition to that, it's the symptoms of the disease itself, the sudden palpitations. That we have some drugs. Our drugs have not been traditionally good for that. Then they have a lot of side effects. And in some instances, they're risky. Right. So in fact, uh, a lot of times I would think that uh, a uh, an atrial fib ablation in a younger person is much less risky than, than giving that patient some of these drugs for the next 10 or 15 or 20 years and a much better success rate. So we have things we can do with ablation, but the recurrence rates are high and the patients who come with a late stage AFib much more difficult to treat. And nobody, you know, there's, there's a lot of different theories. I don't think it's a disease that we'll ever be able to totally fix. The symptoms we're going to be able to placate and uh, and uh, treat the symptoms well. Uh, we might be able to slow the progression of the disease, like you said, right. by by uh, preventing. And and it, this is true for every kind of degenerative disease. We're finding out now for cardiac disease in general that if you uh, the more re episodes, bad episodes you have, it tends to cause progression of the disease. So the more uh, AFib episodes you have in a month, it's more likely that a year from now you'll have permanent AFib. The more episodes of congestive heart failure you'll have in a, in a, in a year, uh, the same thing, it, it, you might end up on a transplant list oh. sooner or, or you might be going, you know, you might not survive for five years. So those kind of degenerative diseases, we used to think that the only reason to treat is to prevent the symptoms, uh, but the truth is that by preventing these acute exacerbations, we're actually preventing progression of the disease, wow. more importantly even. Well, I gotta tell you, um, fascinating topic, and I know you're very busy, and I don't wanna take up a lot more of your time, but I, I've got a, a quick a question for you. When I, uh, five or six years ago, there was a gentleman that I was talking with, and he had some heart issues, and. His doctor said, you know, maybe you should think about doing some walking or some exercise. And we were just talking as friends. And I said, well, what are you, what are you going to do about that? And he said, well, I believe that you only have so many heartbeats in a lifetime. Yeah, I heard this before. And if, if I get out there and, and use them all up by accelerating my heart, I'm not going to have as many. So I'm not too worried about exercise. What's your thought about that? Well, you know, if you train your heart, you bring down your resting heart rate. Right. So exercising for 30 minutes and getting your heart rate up, if you change your resting heart rate from 80 or 90 beats per minute to 60, that makes all the difference in the it's world. It's just a math problem. It, yeah, just it's just a math, math problem. But even if you believe in that, yes. if you train your heart and you reduce your resting heart rate, then you've made yourself, you're going to be able to last longer, right? Right, right? So that's what I answer to that. And there is an obvious training effect, and we can all achieve it. We can all drop our resting heart rate by easily by 10 beats a minute, uh, 10, be 10 beats uh, from like 70 to 60 or 80 to 70, just by exercising for six months right and that then you have you know years after that well I do enjoy the technology that you can monitor your heart rate and, and monitor certain physiological things that are taking place and uh, and my resting heart rate is typically about 52 right. so I think that's a really good right. resting heart rate but that seeing that feedback has yeah. allowed me to kind of focus in on what I'm doing and, and making my training more effective yeah. uh, so that I'm not just... And there's there. a point of getting, you know, of too much training sure. too. Sure, sure. Where it goes too low and right. you get symptoms. So there is, you know, we see that in marathon runners yeah. when they're very aggressive. It's like stretching. You can, you yeah. can be too, too flexible. Aggressive. You can yeah. be too trained for yeah. the heart. There's, you know, it, as you, you've probably there's said a long time, moderation is kind of yeah. the key to everything. Yeah. Uh, as long as you stay uh, reasonable, right. uh, then you'll get a benefit but not go over, over the line. So. Right. Don't, don't injure yourself. Right. Don't damage, you know, don't make it worse. Dr. A. Okay. Thank you very much for Thank your time. You. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. He's so good. <laughs>